Hi everyone who's joined us um, so far. We're going to give give it another minute or so just to give um, a few others a chance to find us and uh, join the Zoom. So welcome everyone. Um, I think I'll begin with um, just the, the sort of procedural housekeeping stuff um, while a few a few others uh, come in through the virtual waiting room. Uh, so welcome um, everyone to this media and gender event. Um, I'll just briefly explain um, how this how this virtual event is going to run, um, finding your way around um, the Zoom platform and uh, briefly tell you a little bit about um, uh, the media and gender group and the, um, the great speakers that we have uh, with us here today. Uh, so the, the media and gender research group is an informal uh, network of feminists across the UK and across the world. Um, I think we can see that in the list of attendees um, in this Zoom call um, today. As a group, we provide an inclusive, collective and generative space to nurture feminist research. The group provides a fruitful opportunity in which to discuss the feminist challenges that we see in our media culture and in our wider everyday social and political contexts. And today we're really excited to be celebrating the launch of the new book, Imagining We in the Age of I, Romance and Social Bonding in Contemporary Culture, edited by Mary Harrod, Suzanne Leonard and Diane Negra. Um, so just to make you aware, I think you should be able to see um, the notice up at the top of your, of your screen. This, uh, this event is being recorded and it will be made um, available um, afterwards um, as uh, in case we have uh, people that can't join us from different time zones and indeed something that you could share with uh, your students and, um, and colleagues afterwards. The way the session is going to run is, uh, first of all, we have um, uh, an introduction from the book editors, Mary, Suzanne and Diane. And uh, then there'll be some lightning talks by uh, some of the contributors to the collection. We have G. Yu An, uh, Jacqueline Ballantyne, Jilly Boyce K, and uh, Misha Kafka today. And then we're going to have a response by Linda Mishayevsky. And at the end, there will be time for uh, questions from uh, everybody here listening to the talks as well. So, um, and when it comes to the, the Q&A at the end, uh, feel free to use the raise hand function, um, or if you'd prefer, or you've got a, a poor connection, you can also use the chat box. We're gonna keep all of the questions till the end uh, of the event, but obviously if questions come to you as, uh, as you're listening to the, to the talks, by all means, pop them in the chat box and we can um, come back to them um, at the end of the event. So I think, I think that's enough um, talking from me. Uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce um, the speakers as we get to um, each of their talks uh, during the sessions, uh, during the session, sorry. Uh, so as I said, we'll begin with um, a discussion from uh, the editors of this uh, wonderful new book. Uh, we have Mary Harrod, who is uh, University of Warwick. She's the author of From, Fra From France with Love by I.B. Torres, um, Heightened Genre and Women's Filmmaking in Hollywood with Palgrave Macmillan, 
and the co-edited collections, The Europeanness of European Cinema with Ivy Torres and Women Do Genre in Film and Television with Routledge. And that was the winner of the British Association of Film, Television and Screen Studies Best Edited Collection Prize. Suzanne Leonard is Professor of English and Director of the MA Gender and Cultural Studies at Simmons University in Boston in the US. She's the author of Wife Inc, The Business of Marriage in the 21st Century with NYU Press and also Fatal Attraction uh, with Wiley Blackwell. And she's the co-editor of 50 Hollywood Directors with Routledge. And Diane Negra is Professor of Film Studies and Screen Culture at University College Dublin in Ireland. A member of the Royal Irish Academy, she's the author, editor and co-editor of 12 books, the most recent of which uh, was just released over the summer, Shadow of a Doubt. She's the co-editor in chief of Television and New Media and chair of the Irish Fulbright Commission. So I shall hand over to you uh, three wonderful editors. It falls to me to, to thank Melanie initially and Jilly and the media and gender research group as a whole for giving us this platform. We're so pleased to be here. Um, it's also just really lovely to see the faces of some people that I've only ever had email correspondence with, um, even if it's on a screen. So nice to see you all here. And um, thanks for taking time, all the listeners out of your Friday afternoon or whatever time of day it is where you are. So I'm not going to talk for long. Um, I just want to say a little something about the early genesis of this project. It really came from one idea, um, which was that the greater the scepticism our culture has about interpersonal intimacy, epitomized by but not limited to romantic passion, the more we seem to put this on a pedestal. And I was kind of fascinated by that paradox. I think we can all think of uh, reasons to be sceptical, you know, uh, there are many kind of truistic ones, raising, rising divorce rates generally, uh, falling birth rates, social atomization, we're always talking about it. And as for um, evidence of what I mean about vaunting intimacy, uh, obviously in fiction we have romantic narratives selling like hotcakes, and actually even more so since the pandemic for obvious reasons. Um, movies, rom-coms and so on, romantic movies endure even if they are getting different nuances and uh, have migrated in interesting ways to TV and, and other forms. But also more generally outside of fiction you might think in terms of performativity of the rituals around the um, marriage ceremony and the wedding uh, industry, very much uh, Suzanne's uh, bailiwick. So another key aspect though that really runs through the collection that I was struck by at the beginning was the way that technology um, has a power to influence and mediate both tendencies. And that's at many levels. So thinking about how it separates us, we might look at older technologies like transport technologies, um, but more recently, of course, digital tech is, is everybody's bugbear. But at the same time, you know, digital technology is a key actor in new channels for imagining intimacy, whether it's through new consumption platforms or even through the role of AI in human interactions, which can be seen uh, as a promise or a threat and sometimes both at the same time. The film Her by Spike Jones was certainly something of a poster child for this project. And I'll say something more about that in a moment. So anyway, I was fascinated by this. There I was a film scholar focused quite significantly in previous research on Europe as well to add to it and thinking, how am I going to do anything about, you know, getting more into this? I thought to myself, it's a really a, a human interest topic. So I decided to apply for a grant from the British Academy called the Rising Star Engagement Award because precisely it involves public engagement and they happily funded me to, to run three events at the University of Warwick the first being a symposium, and then that was followed by a, a, a screening with Q&A of her for the general public at the Warwick Arts Centre the next day. So I was able to have some of the same um, people who'd speak, spoken at the symposium who might have travelled from a long way, in, including Suzanne. Um, and then finally, we had a study day uh, six months later, which you know also involved postgraduates. So it wasn't cherry-picked people, it was a, an open call event. That was all a um, huge learning curve, quite uh, imposing, having to invite luminaries, uh, some people 
were more reliable than others as well. We had different different people on the program at times. But what what is a happy thing is that very many excellent people came uh, and spoke at these events and um, are then in publications. I can see, um, in addition to the people who are sort of named on the program of today, uh, Diana Holmes and Maria Sanfilippo were both speaking. And of course, um, my co-editors, Diane and Suzanne. So uh, I had met Suzanne briefly when I lived in Boston for a year, simply because I really liked her work. I'd seen her speak at SCMS and I noticed she was nearby. So I just thought I'd drop her a line to have a coffee at this point. Um, this project wasn't even a glint in my eye, as the proverb goes. So that, oh, perhaps there was something in my subconscious. It was very fortuitous. So then I immediately thought of her for this and we knew each other a little bit. As for Diane, I'd heard her speak as a, a PhD student at King's in the film department, talking about her gender uh, and the recession work with Yvonne Tasker. Um, so I was very, very pleased indeed that she also wanted to be involved and more pleased even towards the end of this part when I was beginning to think, oh my goodness, now I have to do a publication and I feel like I'm not really qualified and don't have enough good papers yet. And uh, Suzanne approached me, uh, I was extremely, I was over the moon. And then she said that Diane would also be interested. So I think it's time that I hand over to them to talk about the next stages, but um, I, I've had a wonderful collaboration with them and would actually like to take this opportunity to say thank you to, to my co-editors as well. Thank you so much, Mary. That was such a lovely introduction um, to the collection and to our collaboration. I'm going to attempt to share my screen, which has the table of contents. Oh, let's see if this works. Are folks seeing that? Jilly, I see you. Can you give me a thumbs up? Perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, I apologize, this is a bit small. Um, so that I do recognize, but um, at least it gives you a sense. Um, the other slide has it a bit bigger, Suzanne. There's a second slide, which you might prefer, where I just copied it and made the font bigger. Can you see? I'm sorry, hold on one second. Oh, now you're all seeing my screen. <laughs> oh boy, I think maybe I better stick with what I had. Um, I think it's legible anyway. Okay, is that a little bit better? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, Wonderful. Um, so I, um, I too am so grateful to be part of this collaboration um, and was just over the moon when Mary invited me to come um, as part of her uh, We in the Age of I project. Um, so that was really an honor for me. Um, and then also to get more involved in the project, as Mary mentioned, we ran into each other at SCMS and I said, what are you going to do with all this um, work? And she, she said, you know, maybe a special issue of a journal um, or maybe a book. Uh, and then we just talked more and it really seemed like this was, this was a book that needed, that needed to be written. Um, and uh, I apologies for this, but I've been teaching cultural studies um, terms and uh, works this week. And I started thinking about this project as basically a, um, an issue of how to map the conjuncture, right? So we were basically asking ourselves, how do we represent the social totality of forces and powers that define contemporary intimacy cultures within a global context in our current moment? And Mary touched on a lot of the um, kind of key issues that, that were in the forefront of our mind. Um, tech, um, technology, particularly new technologies, romantic comedy, um, a lot of uh, television shows that were coming out across the globe that were really interested in coupling cultures. So as I started to think about what we ended up, how we ended up mapping this conjuncture, what I realized is we actually had sort of three nodal points that I think are well represented in the collection. And I think I am about to include everyone who is in the collection in this in the um, overview that I'm just going to give, placing them into one of three categories. Um, and a few of them you're going to hear from and a few of the others um, are also here. So just thank you for all of our contributors. And let me just uh, say a thank you to all all of the work um, that went into um, putting together these essays um, and editing them and revising them um, you know, under our guidance. Um, so the first one that I wanted to call our attention to uh, was the notion of pessimism <laughs> about the prospects of couple formation in the age of I. Um, and so I have to confess that from my perspective anyway, this project started from a real place of pessimism. Um, you know, as Diane, uh, Mary and I wrote, interpersonal and intimate communication is widely believed to be in crisis. 
Um, so we wanted to acknowledge this structure of feeling, um, but also delve a bit more deeply into its origins and effects. Um, and so to that end, we begin with Jilly's brilliant piece, Abject Desires in the Age of Anger, Incels, Fem Cells, and the Gender Politics of Unfuckability, um, which I will not say any more about, but I think the title alone is, uh, <laughs> is pretty compelling, and we'll go hear from Jilly shortly. Um, we also have uh, a piece from Bioria, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, um, but thinking about master of none um, and thinking of the question of how um, neoliberal mentalities govern the partner selection process, prompting the question of how we can never be sure we are optimizing our romantic, romantic realities. Um, and clearly the, the notion of constantly one, one upping oneself and getting a better partner or a more productive partner um, kind of informs some of the currents of that show. Um, Ji Yoon An, who you will hear from today, also works on how some neoliberal ideologies are organizing South Korean television dramas. Uh, even and especially those featuring otherworldly beings. Um, you'll see her title is Aliens, Mermaids, and Cartoons. Um, and I know she'll be talking about a few of those figures today. Um, and then finally, in the pessimism category, I'm going to place Jonathan Sikowski's inve investigation of what he calls the bittersweet queer romance, uh, where he discusses two films, uh, Weekend and Paris 559, Theo and Hugo, both of which yoke the acknowledgement of a gay male romance's um, beautiful possibilities to its um, eventual finality. Uh, and in both of those cases, there's a sense of about this, um, these newfound couples are running out of time, right? They're running out of time to sort of be together. Um, so I've, I've, I've grouped all those in, again, uh, my, my sort of <laughs> not, not very optimistic uh, category. Um, and then I have um, what I'm calling the imperative to assess a range of media forms, including new technologies. Um, and this was, as Mary suggested, a key heuristic for us for the book. Um, we wanted to take seriously the notion that contemporary culture is lived on our phones and in front of our screens. Um, and we had to account for the fact that our television, computers, and phones mediate contemporary experiences of intimacy. So there was no way to write a book about contemporary intimacy cultures without really engaging with that, um, that, that technology. So to that end, uh, we have an article by Misha Kafka about some of the first dating technologies, and you're gonna hear a little bit about that shortly. Uh, we also have a piece on the usage of cell phones in the Caribbean context, uh, which examines how phone technologies may facilitate the maintenance of multiple sexual partnerships in Jamaica, which is a norm in that culture. And uh, that piece reads both um, like behaviors related to cell phone usage, but also songs that reference um, cell phone usage um, in, their, uh, in their narratives. Um, in this category, I also include Jillian Silverman's reading of the futuristic film, Her, um, and I believe Jillian is with us today, uh, which displays both a reliance on technological possibilities that we have not quite yet seen in our current world, that is the ability to have a fully human seeming operating system with which the main character has a relationship. Um, but as Jillian um, so adeptly argues, the film also betrays a nostalgia for and a meditation on print media forms. And my final category, um, I'm calling recognition of the possibilities of new arrangements. Um, and I'm using the term educated hope, again, from my cultural studies uh, <laughs> investigation of this week. And the funny thing I realized as I was grouping this together is we have more, um, we have more articles in the educated hope uh, um, um, category than we do in uh, my other two, which sort of caught me by surprise um, in some ways. And again, I also realize I'm the one making these classifications. So um, perhaps I'm just feeling a bit more hopeful. Um, so, as much as we found a persistent strain of despair in contemporary media products, um, I think we would be remiss not to notice the way couple formations are being reimagined in really creative ways. Um, when we started the project, we wrote about the ever-present reminders of romance's apparent inability to thrive in modern, modern conditions. Yet at the same time, Mary, Diane, and I marveled at its persistent status as a cultural ideal and driving force. And that tension um, really animated, I think, a lot of our thinking. Um, so through the course of writing this book, I actually have come to think, as I was suggesting, a bit differently about the longevity of the belief in intimacy. 
Um, and what I've come to realize is a lot of contemporary products are offering ways out of what Indiana Saracen calls heteropessimism, which is a concept we write a little bit about in the introduction. Um, and so, and I'm thinking here specifically of Maria Sanfilippo's piece on consensual non-monogamy as a way to, again, think ourselves out of, um, out of some of this pessimism. Uh, Celestino Delato's work on transnational romance in Hong Kong. Diana Holmes' article on contemporary French romance novels. Um, and finally, oh, and I almost forgot, um, but I don't want to because this is a good one. Andrea Wood's article on male pregnancy and queer re reproductive intimacies, um, uh, which again is, I think, uh, a really interesting, uh, an interesting intervention into the notion of kind of rethinking what intimacies might look like. Um, and then finally, um, Jacqueline Ballantyne, who you'll hear from, um, her article on interraced romance and what she calls the post-millennial romantic comedy, which you'll hear about shortly. So um, again, let me thank you all for coming and just say what, a, um, what an honor it's been to work on this project with all of the contributors and with my, um, my wonderful co-editors. Um, and now I'm gonna turn this over to Diane, uh, who's gonna talk a little bit about COVID and some of the final stages, what happened in the final stages of our, our project. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. So um, I'm gonna make a few remarks and I'm gonna wind up with COVID. Uh, but first I wanted to say that in addition to, um, you know, wanting to thank Jilly and Melanie for facilitating this session and taking the opportunity to say what a pleasure it was working with Suzanne and Mary on this and that we also, I think, want to acknowledge our wonderful contributors who not only produced wonderful work, but did so in this period of incredible disruption to people's lives. So I think we're particularly grateful for that. Um, a point of entry for this project uh, for me was is my MA teaching of an MA module um, on the chick flick, a genre that has been in flagrant decline, at least in its Anglo American form, probably for as long as I've taught that class. Um, and its decline points in interesting ways to how intimacy norms and expectations are under adjustment, as we say in our introduction to this book. Uh, Mary's formulation of imagining we in the age of I offered a means of snapping into focus some of the ways in which prevalent forms of self-interest and self-focus that I think are, among other things, tied to, to neoliberalism uh, impede traditional romance protocols and the sort of question of, well, where does that leave us? Um, so this book is also very interested in the intrusions of app and algorithmic culture and with the prospects sometimes seen in them for new circulatory channels uh, for intimacy. I think one of the things that I was struck by as we were starting to have the conversations that would lead to this book uh, is, you know, how many people seem to be bowing out of the dating market while porno pornography uh, consumption was soaring. Finally, I also hope that our book contributes to an understanding of the gendered popular culture of the last decade. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about, because I am teaching chick flicks at the moment, how the most sort of plangent, you know, most kind of representative images of gender that we've had in popular cinema over that last decade um, are probably Elsa warbling Let It Go and Frozen and Arthur dancing down the stairs in Joker. And it strikes me that in both cases, they're dancing alone or singing alone. And that this kind of sense of, of the couple as being you know, in, in some new place um, is, is very much at the heart of our book. So I just wanted to also emphasize some of the ways that, that this book also is trying to come to grips uh, with COVID intimacy culture. We're interested in how romance discourse shifted as part of a set of, of sort of broader pre-existing alterations in romance as a cultural ideal. And we were very conscious of pandemic media being offered as forms of solace and diversion, and even as lifelines to the broader world under lockdown conditions. We had a lot of conversations about how the aversive conditioning of the pandemic and its devastating impact on social relations heightened pressures that were already evident uh, in a turn underway that saw some people cultivating more intimate bonds with their gadgets, their pets, and their bodies than with partners. So at the heart of this book is an attempt, I think, to, to capture something paradoxical. And the way that we express it is like this. We talk about the fracturing of couple culture, but also its persistence. Thanks very much. Thank you, Diane, Suzanne and Mary. Um, I, I already feel like I have so much I want to ask you and, and talk about, but um, I, I will hand over now to uh, the lightning talks by um, some of the contributors um, to that collection. Uh, 
First of all, um, I'm going to be handing over to uh, Ji Yun, um, and Ji Yun is a visiting assistant professor at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. She received her PhD in East Asian Studies from the University of Cambridge. Coming from a background in music and film studies, she's a Korean studies scholar with interests in cultural trends and flows. Her thesis, titled Family Pictures, representations of the family in contemporary Korean society is forthcoming as a book. Um, thank you for the introduction. Let me quickly screen share as I have prepared some slides. Um, is the screen share working? Great, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. I'm delighted um, to be able to introduce my chapter. Um, so my chapter is based on a trend that I noticed in recent K-drama. And I don't know if we have any K-drama fans here today, um, but if we do, I hope that you'll recognize perhaps one or more, one or more of these shows seeing as they were quite popular. And even if you're not, hopefully it'll still be a relatively fun insight into kind of the K-drama landscape. So despite the general kind of global trend away from rom-coms and romantic melodramas, the romance genre has always been and continues to be an integral part of K-drama, um, and not just in terms of domestic popularity, but also as a dominant element in the ongoing Hailey wave. So within that genre, I specifically observed that K-drama romances and especially rom-coms since the 2010s started to differ from their predecessors. So they broadly adhere to the kind of familiar rom-com formula of boy meets girl and boy gets girl, but they also started to engage in varying levels of uh, generic hybridity. And in particular, fantasy tropes were consistently incorporated into these romance stories. So I identified this trend from the hit show My Love from the Star, which is a drama that embraces fantasy into its rom-com narrative through the premise of an alien being accident accidentally being left behind on Earth, specifically in Korea in the 17th century. So obviously it's a ludicrous kind of premise, um, but this allows kind of this fantasy character to become the male kind of protagonist of the love story. And for those who might not be familiar with this drama, um, this drama was a huge hit, not just in Korea, but it kind of took Asia by storm and particularly in China. And possibly arising from this drama's immense popularity, I observed that other worldly beings continued to be the object of love stories in the late uh, 2010s. So they were taking forms such as a webtoon character in W, a mermaid in Legend of the Blue Sea, a goblin, which is in Korean Tokebi, it's a folklore kind of traditional character, um, in Guardian, the Lonely and Great God, and the Monkey King in the Korean Odyssey, which is a spin-off, a modern spin-off of um, a Chinese classical novel. Um, and in all five dramas, other worldly beings form heterosexual relationships with their counterpart human characters. And what follows is a generic rom-com storyline that simply spiced up with some fantasy, whether it's time travel or supernatural power. And what, what is more interesting for me, or you know, what was more interesting is that in the same body of works, there was also simultaneous reinventing and integrating of Korean history into the narratives. So specifically a parallel story set in the Chosun period of pre-modern Korea um, was consistently juxtaposed with the contemporary main storyline. So by incorporating a heritage of period setting known in Korean as the Sagal genre um, into these romance stories that already feature fantastical elements, these dramas take shape as a distinct variation of K-drama rom-coms, and I call these the fantasy heritage rom-com. So my interest in this trend uh, is, well, what's twofold. So firstly, considering that these show shows are primarily love stories, um, I first you know, explore how fantasy and the genre of fantasy affects the conventional gender politics of K-drama. Um, so overall, you know, um, I argue that these rom-coms, which were some of the most successful kind of dramas of the decade, um, offer the happy medium between the kind of age old Cinderella story that we most typically find in K-drama um, and more kind of new content that's actively embodying a feminist fight today in Korea. And these are kind of the growing kind of genre that we see. Um, so in these kind of very well-known popular dramas, we see that although female characters have, you know, a little more agency than before, they are still customarily locked into the damsel in distress um, formula. And specifically, I argue that generic hybridity and fantasy 
acts as the guise under which this conservative position is camouflaged. And secondly, I ask more broadly, well, what can be understood from the conservative gender portrayals and the fact that these were immensely popular even today, despite, you know, the growing Me Too movement, etc. Um, so considering that the target audience of these shows were mainly youth in their 20s and 30s, um, I link the conservative gender politics to a latent conservatism that is growing in the contemporary Korean youth as a consequence of the rampant kind of neoliberal capitalist ideology in today's Korea. And related to this, I also interpret the heritage genre and the kind of related themes of time travel as playing a distinct role in providing escapism to the youth audience. Um, so ultimately, to sum up, you know, my chapter sees these kind of K-dramas as, oh, sorry, sees these K-dramas of having engaged in generic hybridity as a way to upgrade the kind of cliched rom-com um, formula, um, but in distinctly kind of having a double layer of fantasy and heritage genres as the generic hybridity, um, they highlight the contemporary youth's disillusionment with reality and provides them with a fantasy world that can play out their yearnings to reject ultra-capitalism. So I hope this was able to give you an insight into my chapter and into these K-dramas and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ji Yoon. That was so interesting and amazing that you managed to convey all of that in just five minutes as well. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Jacqueline Ballantyne. Uh, prior to receiving her MA from New York University with a concentration in cinema studies and new media, Jacqueline works as a digital entertainment producer. Her research interests include contemporary American film and the relationship between race, gender and ethnic ambiguity in romantic comedy. She is currently at work on a proposed essay collection entitled Eligible, Race, Romance and the Post-Millennial Rom-Com, uh, which will consider the history of interraciality in the romantic comedy. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, my chapter, Mixed Feelings, Interrace Romance and the Postmillennial Romantic, Romantic Comedy, considers who can be pictured as a mainstream rom-com coupling and why. Which is to say, what kinds of pairings are typically granted active participation in the rom-com space? And what are the implications when some couplings are considered ineligible to fully participate within it? So I started thinking about these questions partly because the rom-com's malleability has long been celebrated as key to its remarkable resilience. As one genre survey notes, we can attribute its enduring popularity to the ways the rom-com exhibits an ongoing negotiation between a flexible body of convention. But underlying this intrinsic flexibility is an often unspoken rigidity. Depictions of mixed race romance have frequently been absent or fixed at the genre's edges. Scholarship about interracial intimacy in a comedic context is rarer still. And maybe this is because the rom-com has been described both as popular culture's most salient narrative of marriage and as a genre whose subject matter is treated as trivial. But when, for example, the non-white would-be heroine enters the rom-com space, she is typically presented as neither able to tell a trivial story nor as universally representative of marriage culture. Mixed Feelings then explores three recent attempts to reimagine what has until very recently been the rom-com norm. Centering respectively a Black, a Korean, and a Puerto Rican American heroine, the incredible Jessica James, to all the boys I've loved before, and someone great are among, among a new crop of cross-racial rom-coms in which a non-white heroine is the swoon-worthy object of desire. I began by assessing the lingering effects of the production of cinema's first on-screen interracial kiss on the modern rom-com. Then I consider how the genre's frequent impulse toward nostalgia has inhibited the interrace coupling's ability to thrive inside the rom-com space. And then finally, I suggest that this new wave of interracial romances epitomizes what I call the post-millennial romantic comedy. I use this typology for an iteration of rom-coms produced in the late 2010s onward that provoke a revisionary examination of the genre. Newly emergent or re-emergent from an historical consignment to the genre's edges, post-millennial rom-coms signal a significant, if slow moving shift in how we understand comedic romance. And these films core relationships occupy a mercurial third location where nostalgia thrives between progress and regress. 
And as such, they suggest new and newly complex possibilities for the genre. Thank you, Jacqueline. That was, um, again, so, so interesting and an amazing timekeeping too. So thank you for that. Um, next up in these um, short talks, we've got um, Jilly Boyce Kay. Uh, Jilly is lecturer in media and communication. She's published widely on feminism and media, and she's the author of uh, the wonderful monograph, uh, Gender, Media and Voice, Communicative Injustice and Public Speech with Palgrave. And she's the co-editor of the collection, The Wedding Spectacle Across Contemporary Media and Culture with Routledge. She edits the cultural commons section of the European Journal of Cultural Studies. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, and thanks to all the editors and contributors. I'm really pleased to be um, uh, here amongst all these wonderful talks, um, which have been fascinating so far. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about my contribution to this book and um, as Suzanne mentioned my chapter is called Abject Desires in the Age of Anger, Incels, Femcells and the Gender Politics of Unfuckability um, and I became really fascinated by, <clears throat> by this topic um, because of the ways that involuntarily, involuntary celibacy um, has become really narrowly coded as pertaining to white heterosexual masculinity in the rise of the figure of the incel. Um, so women, on the other hand, who are involuntarily celibate or femme cells, as they are sometimes known, on the other hand, are invisible in contemporary culture, um, or as I argue, more precisely, they are illegible um, due to deeply ingrained beliefs that any woman can get sex if she wants it. So therefore, you know, the category of the femme cell is sort of um, impossible. So my chapter argues that we must um, see this as part of a much broader tendency um, in neo neoliberal culture to centralise and worry over the left behindness of white men and boys, which of course we saw especially in narratives around Brexit and Trump. And at the same time to ignore or dismiss the exclusions, humiliations and injustices experienced by women and people of colour. So many commentators on both on the left and right have identified male incels as emblematic of the zeitgeist of the injustices of the new economic and social order. So incels provoke obviously various shades of horror in media commentary, but also some sympathy and understanding um, um, from commentators and academics, some of who has suggested that the solution to the problem of men's sexual exclusion may be to redistribute sex. So, for example, conservative New York Times columnist Ross Duthat writes that as offensive or utopian as the redistribution of sex might sound, the idea is entirely responsive to the logic of late modern sexual life because, and he goes on, like other forms of neoliberal deregulation, the sexual revolution created new winners and losers, new hierarchies to replace the old ones, privileging the beautiful and rich and socially adept in new ways and relegating others to new forms of loneliness and frustration. Um, so for Jordan Peterson, um, inceldom is a product of women's increasing hypergamy, um, or that is that, that women compete apparently for the most desirable men, therefore leaving most men single, and that's the root of the problem. Um, and the solution to this, Peterson suggests, is the reinforcement of social norms of monogamy. So enforced monogamy is his, is his solution to the problem. Um, from another perspective, the sociologist Eva Aluiz classifies incels, and she's obviously talking about male incels, as the most extreme and disturbing manifestation of the transformation of sexuality through the new social, uh, new social hierarchies generated by scopic capitalism. Um, and that is a form of capitalism in which value is created through the spectacularization of bodies and sexuality in a sort of intensely image-based culture. And yet, of course, for me, and I think for many other people, it's clear that it's also women who don't fit the narrow paradigm of thin, light skinned and thin and able bodied beauty, who are also patently devalued within the new hierarchies of scopic capitalism, but somehow um, this doesn't command our cultural attention in the same way. Um, so the, the losers of, sex, of the new kind of sexual culture are persistently reimagined to be male, uh, white men. 
Um, so for example, Alouis identifies the female counterpart of incels, not as femme cells, but as, as extreme housewives. So she sees those as the kind of female equivalent of, in, of incels. So the femme cell or the involuntarily celibate woman simply just doesn't register in discourse about involuntary celibacy. And when I told people I was writing about femme cells, the most common reaction that I had was one of disbelief or surprise. So they just simply didn't think that such a thing was possible or existed. But um, there are growing numbers of women who identify as incel or involuntarily celibate. Um, and my chapter looks particularly at um, a Reddit group, um, True Femme Cells, which was set up in 2018. And when I wrote the chapter um, in 2020, it had about um, 25 and a half thousand um, users, which is not an insignificant number in the content, in the kind of ecology of Reddit. Um, it was actually banned earlier this year for promoting hate speech. At, um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into that, but that's a whole other story. Um, femme cells have many shared experiences with male incels using much of the same language like chads, stacy, sexual market value, all of these kinds of um, terms. And they too feel cruelly excluded from the sexual marketplace, you know, and that's the, the language which is used, but also more broadly from the public sphere in which unattractive women are seen to be denied a whole range of romantic experiences and social benefits which attend feminine desirability. So as you probably know, many male incels subscribe to a red pill philosophy in which they sort of submit to or embrace the terrible truth um, that men who lose the genetic lottery um, will inevitably face um, shallowness and fairness um, in their lives. And fem cells similarly refer to pink pill philosophy, which is a, a sort of similarly desolate understanding of human nature in which sexually undesirable women are the victim of society's lookism and inevitable prejudice. Um, it seemed to be an inevitable prejudice. Um, so true fem cells, um, as I discuss in the chapter, um, one of the major experiences of people on the forum was, was being relentlessly trolled by male users on Reddit who denied their um, entitlement to identify as incel. Um, so victimhood is sort of made an artificially scarce resource um, and sexual exclusion is seen which is something which is um, not, ava not available as an identity for women. So fem cells, I argue in the chapter, are doubly objectified, abjectified cast out from mainstream beauty standards and romance cultures, but simultaneously deny the possibility of building an identity based on their experiences of exclusion and loneliness. And these um, forms of misogyny and trolling that they experience, I, I'm arguing are not aberrations, but rather a product of hegemonic ideas about heterosexuality. And this, this really pervasive insidious idea that women are the ones that wield all the sexual power in our culture um, while men and particularly white men are the ones who are left behind who are the losers in the new sexual economy but also the, the, the economy more broadly. So my chapter argues that even the shadowy underside of heterosexual culture, the abject domain of its exclusions, rejections and humiliations is also structured by broader gender inequalities under neoliberalism. And that I think to understand the intimate injustices of neoliberal culture, we would do well to stop paying so much attention to white male incels and start paying some more attention to fem cells. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you, Jilly. It feels so strange doing these talks and not being able to hear uh, applause after each, um, <laughs> each talk, but I'm sure everyone is um, quietly clapping um, at home in front of their screens. Um, finally, to wrap up this, uh, this section with the, the small um, uh, talks from contributors, we have uh, Misha Kafka. Misha is Professor of Cross-Media uh, cross Culture at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. She is the author of Reality Television, Affects and Intimacy, and Reality TV. And she's the co-editor of volumes on transnational reality television, gothic culture, and feminist theory. She has also published widely on gender, celebrity, and affect in relation to television, film, and media technologies. 
Okay, thank you so much, Melanie. Um, I just want to start by giving a big shout out, um, not only to our editors, but also to our editors as writers of the introduction. Um, I think the introduction to this book is excellent. I really enjoyed it. And it's extraordinarily thought provoking and I would highly recommend it to um, anyone who hasn't yet had a chance to read it. Um, and I'm going to pick up um, just to start on a phrase from the introduction about the fact that we're experiencing seismic shifts in intimacy. And I I really like the word seismic here because um, it draws rhetorically on something that for my chapter is really important, which is this notion of scientific objectivity and empiricism. Well, seismic, of course, also holds onto and pulls us back into some sense of nature, right? So seismic implies that the earth is rumbling and shaking beneath our feet. And indeed, what better way for us to be talking about love and intimacy? And yet a seismic shift is in fact, the way the scholars of intimacy practices talk about not the nature of love and intimacy, but rather talk about the mediation of something so human and natural as love, of its mediation by technology. Um, and it seems that the goal of romance has supposedly at least not changed, but the process, most people agree, has become thoroughly technified. Um, and indeed, um, the swipe, not even the word Tinder, as in I'm on Tinder, which everyone seems to be, it's rather the swipe that has become the metonym for um, romantic choice making in our era, with all of its attendant anxieties, anxieties about transience, about superficiality, anxieties about formulaic repetition of making romantic choices. Now, it strikes me that with transient superficiality and repetition, all of these things could, in fact, be said, have been said about once meeting dates in bars. But with the swipe, of course, we have a new feature. We have the sheer ease with which the convenience of technology increases our disposability as potential romantic partners and the disposability of others as kind of intimates to ourselves. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with statistics about um, how quickly dating apps um, have replaced on-site meetups um, and the intermediation of um, dating and matching by friends and family. Um, let's just suffice to say that it has been very quick and um, very huge in terms of the statistics of how many people are now really kind of seeking love matches on apps. Rather, kind of what drew me um, to this project is something more of a genealogical mindset. I took it for granted that um, love is now technified, but I asked myself, how long has this been the case and in what ways has love been technologically mediated? And more importantly, I kind of set out to try to figure out who came on to whom. Um, is it love that came onto technology or is it technology that came onto love? Um, in other words, do we love our algorithms or have algorithms kind of always been about love? And I'm a little bit perverse in my thinking, so the spoiler is that I suspect it's the latter. Um, now, in my chapter, I reconceive this set of questions as a genealogy about matching media, and I move kind of um, quite sinuously between the notion of matching media and matchmaking media, right? So sometimes I call it matching, sometimes I call it matchmaking, depending on how it works. But um, what's notable for me is that um, that that kind of these these love matches, the technology of love matches has really kept up with technological kind of developments across the second half of the 20th century. Um, and so every time that um, sort of um, computation has developed another stage um, and has kind of re-socialized itself in technical terms, then kind of um, these issues of love and compatibility have always been there to exploit and make use of these technological advances. We of course have a habit of saying that this is true of pornography, right? That pornography drives all technological advance, and I wouldn't in the least bit disagree with that, but through kind of my work, I'm starting to think that love and intimacy is, is right there behind porn in terms of exploitating and making use of um, these technologies. Now, um, I kind of divide my examination of this um, into a a number of parts. Um, I start with a great interest in the early days of computer dating. Um, 
which is um, was kind of initially launched in the mid 60s by a bored Harvard undergraduate um, together with his um, dateless friends. Um, in this case, his name was not Mark Zuckerberg, but Jeff Tarr, um, who in 1965 um, set up Operation Match. Um, out of his dorm room, and Operation Match um, was quite um, it was quite successful, simply in terms of making money, but it was also successful in terms of drawing people who wanted to fill out um, a form of about six questions, um, the answers to which were then kind of fed through punch cards into powerful IBM mainframe computers, and um, and then they would kind of spit out possible matches um, for people who had. Um, turn, um, filled out the questionnaire. Now, um, partly this is really interesting to me because this um, this sort of 60s era sort of uses the mainframe to draw out another kind of technology, which is the technology of kind of psychological questionnaires themselves, um, the craze for psychological testing in the 1950s and being able to do a certain form of self-diagnosis through filling out questionnaires. And this in the 60s becomes the technology of compatibility testing. Um, and the idea here is that compatibility testing, when done right, that is through computation, will be able to decrease randomization, right? So that the number of people that are given to you as possible dates has somehow decreased the randomization of whomever you might meet on the street at a dorm party or in a bar. But it's also notable that, that at the same time as it decreases randomization, it also increases the game effect, right? So it increases the computer, the, the computation aspect of this, the technification of love here comes with a certain added bonus of pleasure. So I moved from, from kind of discussing these early, um, these early um, dating um, technologies to think about um, online dating sites and online dating sites start up really with um, the availability of, of the internet as a domestic technology, right? So this is kind of the rise of Match.com in the mid 1990s, um, as well as all of these kind of terms, the, um, the, the sort of companies that we now know as being the main um, computer dating companies such as eHarmony, all of them kind of in the first decade of the 2000s are after the holy grail of the perfect match formula. Um, and they are increasingly outsourcing the love search to recommendation algorithms. Um, and I'm really interested still um, kind of beyond what I was able to fit into the chapter, I'm really interested in this link between um, love and kind of recommendation algorithms because recommendation algorithms as they have developed over the last um, 10 to 15 years have really developed in terms of collaborative filtering. Um, and collaborative filtering is in effect the purification of algorithmic matching based on the preferences of others, right? So we get, um, we are better, our desires are better filtered, right? Into the things that are most compatible with us because we are serialized as it were with others who may have similar desires. Now, once we begin to apply collaborative filtering to dating sites, um, sort of two things of note happen. One is of course that we we get a demonogamization of romantic desire for the sake of better compatibility. So it's not really about my sort of choice of one romantic partner with whom I'm going to stay any longer. It's about kind of my desire being massified through the preferences of others so that I will be able to find my best choice, right? So this demonogamization is built into collaborative filtering, but something else begins to happen, which is the depersonification of love. And um, this is also something that gets picked up in the introduction to this book, um, which is that um, is sort of one of the ways in which intimacy cultures are shifting is really that it's not necessarily about the love object being a person, the love object can very well now be commodities. And of course, collaborative filtering is used to give us all sorts of love objects that are going to fulfill our desire from um, um, hello, 
um, the next thing we're going to watch on Netflix to um, whatever it is that we buy online when we go kind of internet shopping or we're looking for clothes or um, or whatever it is that we're out there looking for. So um, so this kind of move on the one hand of demonogamization and the depersonification of love, I think, is really central to what we want to be talking about when we're talking about this kind of technification of intimacy um, of intimacy cultures under digital capitalism. Now, in the final section of my article, I do go back to my first love, um, which is reality television, as you may have noticed from the fact that I have a bad habit of writing books that are called reality TV. I've really got to stop that. Um, and I examine television itself as a matching technology, but one that is more interested in the process of matching and matchmaking than in the product, so that reality TV is never exactly trying to get it right, it being the process, even though it is holding out the goal of finding Mr. Ms. or Mix right. Um, so reality television television incorporates love technologies increasingly so as well as algorithmic um, sort of um, the filtering technologies but it does so in a tongue-in-cheek way because reality tv plays with the impossible possibility of the fact that we need a spark for love right the possibility of generating sparks in a way that cannot in fact be predicted and has to be left to a certain degree of randomization and so I kind of appreciate television, reality television specifically and its matchmaking principles for keeping alive this randomization. I know I'm um, way over time, and um, but I did have a final thought, which goes well beyond my chapter, but it's really inspired by um, the introduction. And I just wanted to throw it out there because I was interested that the introduction mentions um, Indian matchmaking, the Netflix program, which I truly enjoyed. Um, and in speaking about Indian matchmaking, it comes up because of the way in which these um, televisual or algorithmic or um, online computer or dating app matching processes are deeply flawed because they're prejudicial about um, matchmaking, right? There are prejudices built into it on the basis of class and race and beauty and age and um, all those things that um, we, in various ways, the, um, the, the kind of the lightning um, lectures have been, have been discussing. But I'm really kind of interested because I've been doing some work on dating apps and the way that people talk about their preferences on dating apps. I'm really interested in what happens to the way that we're able to articulate as well as put into practice our love preferences in a political climate of radical inclusivity, right? So, um, so when we politically believe in the possibility, in the utopian possibilities of radical inclusivity, what does this do to the way that we can think about intimacy, especially within coupling cultures? given that coupling demands exclusivity, right? Um, that monogamy, in fact, demands exclusivity. And so I'm kind of beginning to think about how do we express and justify even to ourselves the sort of exclusions that we make every time we swipe and cut somebody out, right? And, um, and we have the goal, of course, of couple them, but perhaps those justifications are harder to carry and perhaps it's better or even easier to give that job over to technology. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. I'm, I'm desperate to go and read all of the chapters now. I, I made a start to the book and I, I desperately want to pick it back up and, um, and continue reading. Uh, thank you. Um, what we'll do now is, um, is hand over to our respondent. I'm really excited to, to invite now um, Linda Mishievsky to, uh, to respond to the discussions um, today. Linda is Distinguished Professor in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at The Ohio State University, specializing in cinema studies and popular culture. She is the author of, of many uh, books, including um, Divine Decadence, um, uh, uh, The Siegfried, uh, Siegfeld Girl, uh, Hard, Hard Boiled and High Heeled, um, and It Happened One Night. Her most recent monograph, Pretty Slash Funny, Women, Comedians and Body Politics, has won honorable mention for two National Book Prizes. 
She's also the co-editor of the anthology Hysterical, American Women in Comedy, winner of the Susan uh, Koppelman Prize from the Popular Cultural, uh, Culture Association. And she's currently working on a TV milestones book about the series, The Americans, and co-editing an anthology on Carrie Fisher. So I'll hand over to you, Linda. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. And I hope that uh, my summary and response makes everyone even all, all the more desperate to read all the chapters. Uh, what I'm responding to here are not just the four presentations, but generally what I see as uh, the four major contributions that the book makes uh, at, at, at kind of common threads. And what I see as the things that uh, mark this as a really significant book in the way that a, a lot of us will think and teach uh, about romance and intimacy. Okay, um, first of all, um, a major contribution. It, this book focuses our attention on the bodies and populations left behind in the popular imagine, imaginary of romantic intimacy. My cat has just decided to launch herself onto <laughs> to the keyboard, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, this collection repeatedly emphasizes how the imaginary of, of romance has failed to include people of color who are filtered off by dating apps and as Jilly Kay points out, excluded from the discourses of incel anger. Jilly's essay cites Sonu Beatty's concept of sexual racism, which we see again in Jacqueline Ballantyne's essay on the interracial rom-com. Uh, Ballantyne writes, centering romantic desire on the non-white female body is rare because a finite set of bodies may entertain the idea of or be con conceivably pictured as romantic heroes or heroines. The romantic imaginary has also excluded LGBTQ populations as well as Jonathan uh, Sikoski writes in his essay, The Bittersweet Queer Romance. He writes, queer romance is not equal to straight romance because systems of homophobic persecution make loving queerly a different spatial, affective, and temporal proposition. Sikoski has pinpointed in that passage Another through line of this anthology, the imprecation of the discursive and the material, the intersections of bodies and narratives. And I see this as a second major contribution of this book. The analysis of pop culture romantic texts as strategies linked to technologies and economies. So Ji Yoon's essay on K-dramas illustrates how a neoliberalist economy with its ideology of the self as commodity compels the trend of fantasy and nostalgia in these dramas that seem to be an escape or alternative from that economy, which return us to its most prevalent ideology. She concludes in her essay, the patriarchy seen on Korean screens is clearly reflective of an unchanging reality. Another example is the brilliant essay by Burton and Yi Shui, arguing for the Jamaican cell phone as a discursive concept that organizes intimate relationships in Jamaica. When Burton and Yi Shui turn to a textual analysis of dance hall songs that feature cell phones, they connect the cell phones to a wider discourse enabled by the very technology represented in the songs. A similar move is made by Jillian Silverman in her essay on the film Her that makes us rethink our relationship to what she calls the bibli bibliographic trace. All of us, uh, this moves us away from thinking about representation as a signifier, something separate from the experience itself, and toward the concept of representation as itself a technology and economy in which we're immersed. The third contribution is this collection's insistence on the local and cultural specificity of romance, including the specificities of its transcultural negotiations. The traditions around monogamy in Jamaica, for example, the impact of neoliberalist schooling in South Korea. Along the same lines, Celestino Delato's essay on the rom-com illustrates the racial and ethnic differences of Hong Kong at odds with the cosmopolitan utopianism of that genre's transnational iteration. And Diana Holmes' essay on romantic fiction in France demonstrates what she calls the diverse specificity of cultures, even within the Western capitalist sphere, in terms of gender politics, literary norms, and traditions of romance. We often begin our scholarship on romance and pop culture as if romance itself were a universal and already understood dynamic. And I like how this collection disabuses us of that notion. And finally, similarly opening up our imagination of romance, this collection theorizes how the bodies and desires of romance and intimacy are materialized through technologies and ideology. Uh, Misha's essay on the algorithms of matchmaking, as she just has eloquently explains, um, you know, it, you know, emphasizes that the system that offers us coupons for gardening tools or movies on Netflix, predictive choices made for us on an hourly basis, she says, uh, it knows what we love. But the process is reciprocal. The technologies articulate desire, but other and new kinds of desire can become speakable through shifting economies and technologies. Maria Sanfilippo illustrates how the ideology of monogamy has been undermined 
by economic precarity and has enabled a new emergence of films about open marriage and other kinds of consensual non-monogamy. And Andrea Wood's essay on queer fan fiction shows how that genre, once a marginalized cult phenomenon, has developed crossover readership in the ebook industry, offering, she says, new ways to think about romance and reproduction, merging characters from alien cultures and from ours. So I see in these four big trends, some of the things that uh, uh, Suzanne has uh, uh, articulated as the strands of optimism and pessimism that, that, that run through this collection. Uh, it's a mesmerizing collection, really important and really original. I teach uh, usually every other year a course on the romance uh, and romance generally as sociology, as psychology, as, um, as pop culture text. And this, uh, this, this collection will certainly transform the way I teach that class. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. And thanks again, all the speakers um, here today. I think um, everyone is, is super excited to, um, to get hold of, of this book and take a look at it. What I'm gonna do now is open it up to, um, to everyone here uh, now to begin Q&A. Um, I know we're running a little bit over time, um, but uh, it would be great to, to leave some time now for some, uh, some discussion. So we can use um, the raise hand function on Zoom. We can use the, uh, the chat box if you prefer to type, that's absolutely fine. And, um, and yes, I shall, I shall open it up to the floor. And indeed the speakers, if, if the speakers wanted to respond to, uh, to any of the comments regarding um, each other's chapters. I might abuse my privileges and and begin, um, and I'm I'm particularly interested in in the teaching side actually when it comes to rom coms um, and chick flicks in particular. And I I was a student um, of those kinds of modules um, when when I was at university back when the, we were at the sort of peak of those particularly those sort of post feminist. Um, chick flicks that were um that sort of dominated cinema at that time and i'm i'm supervising a dissertation at the moment and the student has recognized you know that there has been a decline in those kinds of rom-coms and, and that's what the student would like to um uh, to research so i'm i'm just i'm keen to get thoughts from those of you who do teach um popular culture film uh, rom-coms and chick flicks what sense you get from your students today in terms of, and sorry, my cat is now here and going mad next to me, so she might be a bit noisy. Um, I, I, yeah, what sense do you get of, of our students now in terms of, do they engage with, with rom-coms? Are they all that familiar with the kinds of rom-coms that um, a number of, of you have, have been teaching and writing about for you know the last 15 years or so? I mean, yeah, what, what's your sense and how do you, I guess, how do you teach um, uh, about this genre now that we have seen such a shift in, in recent years? Um, sorry, that was a kind of huge question of multiple parts. But yeah, I mean, what, what's your sense? Do our students watch rom-coms anymore? I guess that's to anybody. <laughs> I don't think I'm very well placed to answer this as I'm only teaching in French studies, but they seem to be watching the, the show, The Hookup Plan on Netflix. When I taught about that, they all seem to know it and it's not even that good. So, and it's quite traditional actually, although a TV series, but I'm sure that others have more to say. I think I might add to that, that, um, you know, it's one of the things we do reference briefly in the introduction and, and Mary's point kind of comes back to it too, is, you know, the platform shift to Netflix has been really critical. I think our students do watch um, romantic comedies and dramas, and, but they, they watch them maybe, you know, not so much in the cinema, but in other places. The other thing that, that we talk about a little bit in the intro to this book is, you know, I think it's incredibly useful to teach failed chick flicks and there are plenty of them and the genre has kind of turned sometimes surprisingly experimental in its um, you know kind of post epitaph time so you know I think that there's a lot of pedagogical use value that can come from uh, mixing up romances that are considered to be well crafted with romances that are obviously not terribly well crafted um, so I think pedagogically that's that's actually quite a, a kind of fruitful strategy. 
I would also point out um, sort of prior to the um, to the, the the point at which um, students show up in our classrooms, I would point out how how successful the rom-com teen model is. And of course, um, um, again, Netflix is really central um, to to the, the the distribution of of these kind of um, teen rom coms, and um, and how, of course, the audience is is not just teenagers but also also tweenies. So so there's a way in which um, um, I think yes, absolutely, for adults, um, the the shifts are quite seismic and the ground feels quite febrile. Um, and yet the, the younger generations, and particularly girls, but not only, are, um, are, are really consuming um, some, some fairly traditional models with a few twists. So I, I'm not a teacher, so that's sort of why I'm hesitating to, to chime in on this conversation. But I do want to add partly because um, I am, my essay is about rom-coms and specifically um, to your point, Misha, um, To All the Boys I Loved Before, of course, has been one of the most popular titles of all time on Netflix. Um, and it has, since I wrote this essay, um, had two sequels. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, in some ways it does start to try to address some of the, the failings that I point out in my essay in the first, um, uh, the first film. Um, so for example, that second film, I believe is the one that has a mixed race boy as the love and as the potential love and interest. And then the third one, it sort, um, sort of um, reverts back to the idea of her being having this sort of this feminist drive to go off on her own and move to New York. Um, but I would argue ultimately that it, it's still sort of fits within those very conventional models. She does, of course, wind up being saved by a nice young white man who's the most wholesome guy on the block. Um, so those um, those tropes, they just, they, they are very hard to um, unlodge, I would say. Um, but all to say, I, I, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that, that people, not just students, are definitely still interested in the rom-com as a genre. Um, and that they are still they are still watching it. It just really sort of depends on um, you know how it's marketed. We're all home a lot more now, um, so I think that that's another thing that people will dip in more because they have the time to. Thank you. Um, and I see we've got um, a couple of hands up um, from Jilly and Ji Yoon. And I just wanted to note that um, Maria in the comments is, is responding as well, um, saying my rom-com students watch the Netflix offerings and often lament their homogeneity, uh, but are excited to see innovative um, takes on rom-com. And uh, yes, this is a, a perfect collection to, I think, to um, to introduce into uh, our classes if we're teaching this this sort of popular culture. Um, I didn't see which order the hands went up in. Um, Ji Yoon, your hand is now down. Did you want to, did you want to, or to Jilly? Jilly, would you like to come in? Yes, unless Ji Yoon um, would like to. Um, but um, I was just going to say in response to, um, to the question about students and about what they're watching, um, I have to say that I find it very, very difficult nowadays to, um, to get a class conversation going about any text, which all students may have seen, and I'm sure other people who teach have this experience too, where the kind of fragmentation of um, watching and viewing experiences means that sometimes that it, it is difficult to create that kind of collective class discussion. But the one thing which... The one text which has been, um, which I would say a majority of students um, are familiar with in the UK context is Love Island. Um, and, um, and I guess that's, you know, it's, it, it's really interesting how, um, and, and Misha's chapter is obviously really significant in this regard, how, how um, reality television, we've seen this kind of extraordinary rise of, um, of dating based shows and, um, and romantic couplings. Um, and, and so students are very, very keen to, to talk about that. And it is that kind of, I guess, the it speaks to the sort of paradox, which is central to this book, which is both the kind of um, both the kind of fragmentation, but also the persistence of the couple form um, in. Um, so that I would just just 
want to point to like that sort of strange um strange thing that i'm noticing which is that um something like love island which is about you know like sort of hyper competition very kind of like um traditional and normative ideas about sort of um heterosexuality somehow seems to be sort of um the basis of sort of like collective discussion and you know and public service television actually um in the uk at the moment so yeah that was just all i would like to say about that could I just briefly mention one thing that kind of hovers outside of the scope of this book? Because I think when you fin finish a collection like this, you're you're really content with like the breadth of the book, which I think if I may speak for Suzanne and Mary, we very much are. But at the same time, you're always aware of new things that are coming along. And you know, if 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 we had a new book to write or a part two or anything like that, I think it would be really good um, if we could incorporate, first of all, more work on, on singlehood, which I think is an unexamined topic in general but also on some of the new kind of frontiers of work on um, asexuality. And I feel like that would be, you know, a, a very nice addition to, you know, I, I find myself getting very um, impatient, you know, <laughs> with the, you know, what the, this kind of the, just the, the incredible, um, you know, intransigent nature of certain kinds of couple formulations. It's just astonishing. One of the things that we, um, you know, kind of noticed in pandemic media was how it seemed to revert back or even heighten this tendency to suggest that, you know, single households in the pandemic were vulnerable and at risk. And, you know, this kind of discourse of social concern and, you know, single households are like the majority of households, you know, so th this kind of ability to kind of, you know, keep pretending that certain things are absolutely the norm when they, 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 they no longer are is, is a phenomenon with which I think our book is concerned at many levels. Thank you. Uh, no, I agree. I mean, that that would be an amazing book. And it's it's just sitting waiting to be be written. Um, and yeah, I, I, I've now got lots and lots of thoughts and ideas that I, I want to discuss with all of you. But I'm also conscious, really conscious of time. I was I, I, I really want to get into a conversation about those Netflix Christmas films that come out every year. Uh, but maybe that's that's for another time. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with them. Um, but uh, I, as I said, I, I'm, I'm conscious that we have run over.